It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. A bombshell goodbye from out of the blue. Leah Varadkar resigns as Ireland's Prime Minister. Politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore and then we have to move on. Under investigation, the London clinic where the Princess of Wales had surgery over an unauthorised attempt to access her private medical records. We report from Grimsby on what today's fall in inflation has to do with the price of fish. A family torn apart, we hear from a former hostage who saw her husband and daughter shot dead by Hamas on October the 7th. The questions about the safety of vaping as landmark legislation to stop young people smoking is introduced in Parliament. Perhaps you don't like to be reminded how we got to this point. The Crown, the Crown leads the way with eight nominations at the television BAFTAs. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's coming up in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Hello there, good evening. Ireland's Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, had a rise to high office that was far from orthodox, and his decision to quit today was in keeping with that. In a move which shocked Irish politics, Mr Varadkar, the first biracial and openly gay Taoiseach, said that part of leadership was knowing when the time had come to pass on the baton. That time, he said, was now. He leaves a record of lasting social achievement, but also of areas where, by his own admission, things had gone backwards. He also leaves his Fine Gael party in a precarious political situation ahead of the next general election. Here's our Ireland correspondent Stephen Murphy and a warning of some flash photography. A mystery press conference hastily called. The podium awaited a potential bombshell. Leo Varadkar strode out and didn't disappoint. I knew that one part of leadership is knowing when the time has come to pass on the bat on to somebody else and then having the courage to do it. That time is now. So I am resigning as president and leader of Fine Gael effective today and will resign as Taoiseach as soon as my successor is able to take up that office. His voice cracked as he tried to outline his reasons, political and personal. There are loyal colleagues and good friends contesting local European elections and I want to give them the best chance possible. And I think they have a better chance under a new leader. Politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore, and then we have to move on. Leo Varadkar was Ireland's first mixed-race Taoiseach, first gay Taoiseach and youngest Taoiseach when he became leader in 2017, aged 38. He was seen as emblematic of a modern Ireland, especially after overseeing a referendum to legalise abortion. He battled to avoid a post-Brexit hard border, striking a landmark deal with Boris Johnson. But his prickly nature often irked Brexiteers and Northern Irish Unionists. Do you think you are guilty sometimes of saying things? Things, for example, like Britain needs to come to terms with the fact that it is now a small country. Do you not see that that's provocative or even condescending to people who voted for Brexit? I think sometimes you have to tell it as it is. Recently, he was under pressure, with backbenchers lining up to quit and a crushing defeat in twin referendums. Maybe the writing was on the wall if anyone had looked closer. Leo Varadkar may be stepping down as Taoiseach, but that doesn't mean a general election. A new Fianna Gael leader will be elected in the coming weeks and they will take the Taoiseach's office here with the full agreement of Fianna Gael's coalition partners. They only found out the news last night and seemed as shocked as anyone. I was surprised, very surprised, didn't expect it. Uh, at all. It's not something I had anticipated. Um, and, um, but I do wish uh, Leo the very best. It's not an easy decision for him to take. Uh, a lot of courage in that decision. But not enough courage to call an election, according to the leader of the opposition. Why he took the decision today, I, I can't answer that question for you. And now that uh, Leo Varadkar has made this decision, has resigned, Logically and democratically, we should move in one direction, one direction only, and that is th to the calling of a general election. A politician renowned for doing things his own way has departed on his own terms, but this exit has left more questions than answers.
And Stephen joins us live now from Dublin. So Stephen's surprised today, certainly, but what happens now? The country here still this evening just beginning to digest this absolute political bombshell that, like you said, came absolutely out of the blue earlier today. But already attention turning to who will succeed Leo Varadkar as Fine Gael leader and then Taoiseach or Prime Minister here in Ireland. Essentially, the uh, rules are still being worked out. There's a meeting of the, the Fine Gael Executive Council this evening trying to work out how those nominations will work. Nobody has formally entered their name into contention, although one senior cabinet minister, Simon Coveney, who many UK viewers would remember from the Brexit negotiations when he was the Irish foreign minister, he has already ruled himself out. He was actually defeated by Leo Varadkar in the last uh, Fine Gael leadership election race. He's ruled himself out this evening. But whoever that person may be should be in place as Fine Gael leader by the end of the first week in April. They will then be elected Taoiseach, thanks to the forbearance of the Green Party and the Fianna Fáil party, the coalition partners. But that person, whoever they may be, will probably only be Taoiseach, the new Prime Minister of Ireland, for a relatively short time before we enter the countdown to a new general election, which we expect to be called sometime later in the year, possibly around the same time that the UK goes to the polls. As for Leo Varadkar himself, we simply don't know what his next move will be. He told us today he has no plans in mind, either politically or personally, he's clearly looking forward to some time away from the top job in Irish politics. Stephen, live there in Dublin. Thank you. The Princess of Wales has been the object of intense media scrutiny in recent weeks, but she must have at least been reassured that her medical records after her recent surgery would receive the same protection afforded to anyone else. But today, even that assurance was shattered after an investigation was launched into a report that staff at the London Clinic, where Kate was treated, had tried to access those records. But the clinic, long used by the rich and famous and valued for its discretion, said that there was no place at their hospital for those who intentionally breached the trust of their patients. Here's our Royal Correspondent, Laura Bundock. It's a high-end hospital, favoured by high-profile patients seeking privacy and security. But did the London clinic breach both? At least one staff member attempted to access Kate's medical records, the information watchdog now investigating. They would be gathering information, as much information as possible, and pulling together evidence to assess whether there was a case that could be taken further and should be taken further. This was Kate's last official outing. She spent 13 nights in hospital after her abdominal surgery, treated at the same time as the King. Weeks later, the focus back on the clinic, whose CEO said, we have systems in place to monitor management of patient information and in the case of any breach, all appropriate investigatory, regulatory and disciplinary steps will be taken. The privacy breach has prompted a political response from Health Minister Maria Caulfield, a trained nurse. There are very strict rules about which patient notes you can access. You're only allowed to access the patient notes you're caring for and with their permission. It's pretty severe uh, and it's pretty serious stuff to be accessing notes that you don't have permission to so access. So the London Clinic could be in a lot of trouble? Well, also any, any individuals as well. The princess isn't the only royal with privacy issues. Harry's battle with Fleet Street back at the High Court, with echoes of his mother's difficult times with tabloids. There is one significant difference. Diana sought publicity. Today's royals want to control publicity. And that is where I think the problem has occurred. The fevered fascination with the princess is unlikely to stop, not helped by Kate Gate and the altered family photo. The princess has been told about the breach and it will be a big blow. She wanted time out to recover, but social media had other ideas. Her absence filled with speculation, conspiracies and now this. The investigation will probably take months and Kate may well have returned to public life before we find out what really happened. Laura Bundock, Sky News, Central London. 
Today saw a larger than predicted drop in the inflation rate, something the Chancellor said sets the scene for better economic conditions. That was perhaps borne out by some welcome news for those looking to remortgage, with lenders, including NatWest, cutting their interest rates. The Bank of England will make its latest decision on interest rates tomorrow, with the trajectory of inflation a crucial consideration. Well, the Office for National Statistics says inflation stood at 3.4% in February. That is down from 4% in January and the lowest since September 2021. It was driven largely by a fall in annual food price inflation, down to 5% in February from 7% in January. Well, in the run-up to the general election, the towns of Grimsby and Cleethorpes are the focus of our Target Towns project. The towns sit side by side on the Lincolnshire coast, where the government hopes they can still get their message across to Redwall voters. Why? Well, politically, Great Grimsby has long been a Labour stronghold, but in 2019 turned Conservative for the first time since the end of the Second World War. Cleethorpes, which only became a constituency in 1997, was Labour until 2010. At the next election, the two will be combined into a new constituency, which Labour needs an 11.7% swing to win, close to the level it needs nationally to win a majority. But will today's economic news make that more or less likely? Our economics editor, Ed Conway, reports. Two, five, two, ten, two, ten, two, ten, two pounds. If you want to know more about how prices are set, you couldn't do better than come to Grimsby Fish Market. 140, no one. Economists talk about price discovery. Well, that's what's happening here for cod, for haddock, for halibut. This is the start of a chain which ends up via buyers like Amy with the fish on your plate. Prices have gone up because everything else has gone up. So we're, we're also affected by fuel, uh, electricity bills are a big one because it's chilled or frozen, so we have to keep the lights on and the fish chilled. Uh, paper even has gone up, so the labelling of products, even that goes up, so that's the knock-on effect to the consumer. Put it all together and it helps explain why prices here and across the country are much higher now than a few years ago. Now, what's been happening with fish prices recently is not dissimilar to what's been happening to overall food prices. A bit of a roller coaster, up very sharply thanks to fuel, labour costs, all of the rest of it, and now actually starting to come down. And it's part of the explanation for why inflation is coming down right now. But this is only one small part of the overall shopping basket of prices across the UK. The overall inflation rate dropped to 3.4% in February, lower than expected, and it's expected to fall further in the coming months. Across the dock from the fish market, the renewables industry, offshore wind mostly, is one of this town's success stories in recent years, offering up an alternative future to the fishing industry. These jobs are good quality jobs. They pay well, they're very well skilled. But they too have been buffeted by inflation and high interest rates. What we have seen all around us is uncertainty. So we're very reliant on a supply chain. That supply chain has been fractious, really difficult to maintain. We've seen suppliers go under, we've seen prices, you know, in some, pri in some elements, we've seen prices go up by 30, 40%. Now, inflation is just a measure of how fast prices are rising each year. Just because inflation's down doesn't mean prices are down. They're not. It doesn't mean people aren't feeling squeezed. They are. Yes, you're going to go play again. Gemma recently returned to work after taking time out to study and have children. Like many, she recently refixed her mortgage at a much higher rate, an extra hit to her living standards. We're sort of adjusting to having two incomes which three years ago we felt would massively improve our quality of life, but the economy at the moment has, you know, has sort of taken up that. So we, we're comfortable, we can afford everything that's going up, but it's not the life that we sort of expected we would have due to, to inflation. The Chancellor is hoping that as inflation drops back to normal rates, people start to feel better about the economy. As an election approaches, the message from Grimsby and Cleethorpes, a key constituency Labour are targeting, is that the feel-good factor isn't back yet. Ed Conway, Sky News in Grimsby. Well, if the government can point to some progress on one of its top priorities today, there was more frustration over another, with the House of Lords once again amending legislation that would enable migrants to be sent to Rwanda. This evening, the Prime Minister addressed the 1922 Committee of Conservative Backbench MPs. 
Well, our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, joins us now from Westminster. So, Sam, how secure does the Prime Minister's position look, then, tonight? Actually, Anna, right now, Rishi Sunak looks more secure than he has done in recent days. Look, the Prime Minister addressed that 1922 committee of Tory MPs and peers, as you say, and his message was, we have to unite or die. He reeled off his government's achievements. And according to one long-time Rishi Sunak sceptic who came out afterwards and briefed all of us, he said that, to be honest, across all the different factions of the Tory party, there was pretty much broad agreement and happiness with what the Prime Minister was saying. I think there was only one dissenting critical question across the whole thing. So I'm going to call it now, Anna, and say there will be no plot against Rishi Sunak this side of Easter. Quite possibly not, very least, until after the local elections on May the 2nd. But as we've come to learn, Tory politics in particular is emotional. It runs through convulsions of anger that ricochet around and result in unpredictable moments. And, and they know that in Downing Street, which is why they've done a couple of interesting things. Um, it might only be formally the Easter holidays for parliamentarians from next Wednesday, but tonight the Chief Whip, Simon Hart, told Tory MPs, don't worry about any of the days before then. It's what's known as a one-line whip. Business is non-compulsory in Parliament. The, basically, the Easter holidays start tonight if you're a Tory MP. That, uh, I suspect, will go down well. That was the uh, hope of those uh, making that decision. And the consequence of that is that the Rwanda bill, which you mentioned, yes, uh, there were defeats in the House of Lords tonight, but they're not going to sort that out. They're not going to take that back to the Commons to the other side of Easter. Now, you right remember one time uh, the Rwanda issue was considered an emergency. There was an emergency press conference. It needed to be sorted out very quickly. Well, now, Tory MPs getting a holiday is more important than sorting out this bill, and uh, the people in Downing Street hope that that kind of calculation will take down the temperature if they could possibly allow for it to be so. Sam, with an update from Westminster, thank you. A mother who was taken hostage with three of her children after seeing Hamas terrorists kill her husband and daughter has spoken to Sky News about her horrifying ordeal. Shana Almog Goldstein was taken at gunpoint with her other children and held in Gaza for 51 days. Our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports. The final time that Shen Almog Goldstein saw her daughter, she was dying on the floor of their home after being shot by a Hamas terrorist. Minutes earlier, her husband had also been killed. Shen and her surviving three children were forced to step over his body as they were led out of the safe room at gunpoint. There was no time to say goodbye. There were four or five of them inside the safe room uh, yelling and they shot Nadav in the chest, you know, from very close range. In two or three places he was lying like that with his arms up. Uh, he was quiet. I thought that maybe he was pretending. They were bundled into their family car. CCTV from the Gaza border fence shows the car driving fast along a road and then turning off onto a dusty field. They stopped and they started putting bodies into uh, my trunk, the trunk of my car. And Agam said to the boys, don't look back not to look back. Our abductors were uh, overjoyed. They took a selfie picture. They took pictures of us on the, in the back seat. I remember a Red Cross ambulance, and I was looking and kind of begging with this look that was asking for help, and he looked back at me with this helpless look. For seven minutes on the 7th of October, they were driven into Gaza. They would remain there for the next 51 days. The first two days were in a tunnel, and in the last week we were in a tunnel, and in between we were in apartments. And the conditions in the apartments uh, were not easy. We had electricity only for like 90 minutes a day. There were entire days without electricity. And then when there's water, when there's running water, you need to decide who's going to shower. Throughout these seven weeks, I only showered uh, once. I wanted the children to shower. Shen, Agam, Gal and Tal were regularly moved by their Hamas guards from apartments above ground to tunnels below. The fighting was often close by, the sound of airstrikes frightening. There were times she was worried they might be killed by Israeli forces 
not their captors. It was really scary and dangerous. We were really in danger. When they took us out to the street and we walked down the street and we saw the devastation and destruction, it was really hard. It's, it was terrible. It was terrible to see the destruction, the devastation, the poverty, the children in the streets. On the 26th of November, two days into a week-long ceasefire, Shen and her children were released. We waited in this car for five hours. They said that they were waiting to receive a signal, a phone call from the Red Cross. Everybody around us, you know, the masses were taking pictures of us. It was so humiliating and scary. On Monday, fresh ceasefire talks resumed in Qatar. Hamas has softened its demands, but the Israeli government has still described them as unrealistic and delusional. Shen says a new truce is urgent to get the remaining hostages out, many of whom are badly injured. We need to do everything possible in order to release the people who are still there, to bring them back to their families, to bring them back to our country, and do everything possible so that they'll be released as soon as possible. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. The new Welsh Labour leader, Vaughan Gething, has been formally elected the new First Minister of Wales. Mr Gething is Europe's first black leader and replaces Mark Drakeford, who officially stood down yesterday. Addressing the Senate, the 50-year-old spoke of the historic significance of his appointment and said he hoped to lead a prosperous Wales. Fifteen synthetic opioids have been banned today, classified by the government as Class A drugs in a bid to prevent accidental drug overdoses. It means anyone found with the drugs could face up to seven years in jail, an unlimited fine or both, while dealers could be handed a life sentence. While well, staying with opioids, an IT worker has been found guilty of murdering a couple with fentanyl. Stephen Baxter and his wife Carol were found dead in their home in Essex in April last year. Luke DeWitt had befriended and worked for the couple and rewrote their will so he could seize control of their business after their deaths. Let's listen to the call that he made to emergency services. So, so just tell me exactly what happened from what you know, please, just so we can all go to the best place. Um, well, we've just turned up to the house. Um, they hadn't, we hadn't really heard from anyone for about a day and a half. So we came round, and their daughter got here first, and I think they got round to the back, saw through their conservatory that they were sitting in their armchairs, not moving. And um, we smashed the window to get in. But, but yeah, they're, they're both stiff, cold, and... Junior doctors in England have voted to continue strike action for another six months until September this year in their ongoing pay dispute with the health department. The British Medical Association has asked for a 35% pay rise, but ministers have described the pay claim as unreasonable. Landmark legislation, which means that anyone turning 15 this year will never be legally sold cigarettes, was introduced in Parliament today. It also contains measures to restrict the appeal of vaping to younger people. But new research published today has sounded a warning about the potential negative health impacts of a tool that even the NHS sees as a preferable alternative to smoking. Here's our health correspondent, Ashish Joshi. Dove started vaping six years ago. As a smoker, he was looking for a healthier and cheaper option. My friends were starting it up as well. I tried theirs. It was a nice experience. You don't have to deal with carrying tobacco, everything else. The cost of cigarettes were going up. It seemed like a more cost-affordable option. And it tasted nice, so why not? Dove says other people who swap do it for the same reasons. So are most of your customers ex-smokers or people who are looking to give up smoking? For the most part, yes, I would say so. But now scientists have for the first time made a link between e-cigarettes and an increased risk of cancer. What we have found is that basically changes to the DNA of cells, for instance, in the mouth, um, but they are also reflective of lung tissue um, that are found in smokers where we know that there is a link to cancer. Um, are also observed in e-cigarette users. Tobacco and vapes, Bill. The research comes on the same day the country moved towards stopping the next generation taking up smoking. The tobacco and vapes bill means anyone turning 15 this year 
will never legally be sold cigarettes as the age limit will rise by one every year. The bill will also tackle vaping by introducing new powers to regulate new flavours and packaging that targets children. But that's it. But now we know about this link to cancer, is there a danger that the new law is already falling behind the science? The country's chief medical officer thinks more research is needed. I think it's a useful bit of initial science, but it's not the same as a large study proving a, a link. That'll take a lot longer, but I think what it reinforces is our central message, which is whilst we encourage people who currently smoke, if they find vapes helpful to swap to vaping, we absolutely do not recommend that people uh, who currently do not smoke take up vaping, uh, and it is utterly unacceptable to market to children. The Prime Minister has made banning vapes his personal crusade, urging children to stay away from them. And that message will be easier to deliver if the science proving e-cigarette harms continues to build. Ashish Joshi, Sky News. The final season of the royal drama series The Crown is leading this year's BAFTA TV Awards with eight nominations, including leading actor for Dominic West, who portrays Charles as the Prince of Wales. Other shows getting multiple nominations include The Last of Us and Succession, which includes Brian Cox for Best Actor and Bella Ramsey for Best Actress. And Sky News has also been nominated for our coverage of Myanmar and the Israel-Hamas war, as our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer now reports. It is a very British battle of the social classes at this year's TV BAFTAs. Happy Valley's return after a seven-year break, beloved by critics, arguably the one to beat. Up for five for Sarah Lancashire's impeccable acting and Sally Wainwright's brilliant script, the story of cops, killers and a working-class community. The Crown doesn't ask existential questions of itself. Perhaps it should. Fighting it out against a drama that imagines how the other half live. While the final series of The Crown didn't exactly win rave reviews with its somewhat soapy take on recent royal history, tellingly it's not up for best drama, but it has picked up the most BAFTA nominations this year with eight. Elizabeth Debicki's Diana and Dominic West's Charles, both in contention for their acting. I tried to do right by him and, and, uh, um, and as a parent I, I you know, feel a certain uh, sympathy for him in what he was going through at the time that we're talking about. Why bother going on? An outstanding year for prestige TV drama, which sees Bella Ramsey recognised for The Last of Us, going head-to-head -head with Helena Bonham Carter for her role in Nolly as a crossroads legend. <sighs> Perhaps a surprise, the seven nominations for this one-off story of a sales assistant and the demon who tells her she has to murder three people to prevent the end of the world. An idea which could only come from the brain of Black Mirror writer Charlie Brooker. As the world gets more and more absurd, it just, it just means that you have to sort of approach things slightly differently. You just have to keep turning the dial up, I suppose. We are in the middle of a forest, in a jungle really, and they're attempting to keep these men alive. And Sky News leads the way when it comes to the news category. Up for two out of a possible three nominations, one for Chief Correspondent Stuart Ramsey's extraordinary eyewitness reporting from Myanmar, his team having spent a month undercover living in the jungle. Where there were homes, there is now destruction. And our special programme on the Israel and Hamas conflict, which aired two weeks after the October 7th attacks. A huge team effort, also in contention. Succession's grand goodbye sees it up for five, with Brian Cox and Matthew McFadden's performances singled out. It's one of the few nominated shows which has bowed out over the last year. And while some of the characters might have hoped for better, the ceremony in May, a final chance for a happy ending. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers and the press preview tonight, joined by the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Welcome to both of you. Uh, certainly among the stories, we will be discussing this on the front of the Financial Times. The headline, inflations fall to 3.4%, keeps summer rate cuts on track, the paper tells us. More on that and the rest of the news in just a moment.
Well, this is Sky News in just a moment, the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, a reminder of our top stories. Leo Varadkar has announced he's stepping down as Ireland's Prime Minister and resigning as leader of the Fianna Gael party. An urgent inquiry underway following reports that staff at the hospital where the Princess of Wales underwent surgery in January tried to access her private medical records. And inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two years, driven in part by an easing of food prices. Hello there, you're watching the Press Preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin McGuire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Welcome to both of you. Evening. So, front pages then, let us start with the Financial Times, suggesting that falling inflation is likely to give some relief to Rishi Sunak's government and could pave the way for interest rate cuts this summer. The I2 says the country is on track for rate cuts in the summer. The Daily Mail says the drop in inflation proves that the economy is turning a corner at last. The Express, meanwhile, claims exclusively that a commitment to retain the pensions triple lock will be included in the Conservative manifesto at the next election. More defeats for the government's Rwanda migrants deportation bill in the House of Lords tonight is the top story for The Times. The Metro reporting on the conviction of a man who used opioids to fatally poison a couple whose business he wanted to steal. The Mirror speaks to the husband of legendary Coronation Street actress Julie Goodyear about her worsening dementia. The Telegraph has been hearing from the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, who says the so-called mental health culture has gone too far and that everyday anxiety should not be regarded as a medical condition. And the Daily Star reports on the discovery of a huge gold nugget by a man with a metal detector in Shropshire. Apparently he found it very quickly, though, didn't he? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. So let head, let's head to our guests then, Kevin McGuire and Claire Ellicott. Lots of economy in the papers, uh, including the Daily Mail, that's got an at-last after the mortgage hopers economy turns a corner. And, Kevin, this is what the Chancellor and Rishi Sunak would like to claim, of course. Yeah, they've been claiming it so long, it's such a big corner. It must be uh, yeah, bigger than a... Hyde Park corner and the pace of a snail getting round it. But <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, inflation coming down at 3.4%. 4% was good news. Next month, I think it's when the energy price increase comes out and the cap. So it could be, could be down to 2, which would be the target. It was 11.1% in October 22. And the government is pinning its hopes on people feeling better off. The two national insurance cuts, uh, try, uh, trying to get some growth in the economy. Uh, interest rates may come down in the summer. But the problem with that is people coming off fixed mortgages will still be paying a lot more than they were before, so they may not feel better off. So it, it's, it's kind of good news, but will it save them? I suspect not. Yeah, there was a bit of cutting by lenders, of course, today, wasn't it? And it was down slightly more than predicted, which was 3.5%, yep. fractionally more. Yep. Um, but the... But, you, it... but you, you're yeah. still hit <laughs> when it was 11.1%. You know, that's a permanent hit. Yes, you know, it... People lost that. It, your prices are still going up. It's just they're not going up at the same rate. Yes. It's not as if people are you know, wading through a land of milk and honey. Yeah, we always need to remember that. You're right. Yeah. Um, the will it save them question, and is this the only thing they can you know, pin their hopes on? You know, We'll come to Rwanda perhaps as part of this discussion yeah. in a moment, but, but is this the main thing they could hope for, do you think, ahead of a general election? Well, uh, Rishi Sunak, you know, he's a former chancellor. He wants to stake everything on, on the economy. But the facts are that things are getting better. They look good, um, and yet there's no real relief for the Tories in the polls. The polls haven't really shifted after either of the budget decisions to cut national insurance. And the trouble with falling inf inflation is, as Kevin says, this is great news, but it's going to take so long to filter down for people to feel better. And they've had such a hard time of it that it's hard to see how it really helps the Tories in the short term. Now, if we have an election in the autumn, as increasingly seems likely, perhaps things will, may feel better then. But mm -hmm. you've got problems with frozen income thresholds. People are still paying a lot of tax. Mm -hmm. People don't feel very well off. And... I, d I doubt that it's going to help the Tories anytime soon. And there's that question of public services, stay at the NHS, criminal justice system, uh, potholes in roads, wherever, wherever you look, 
it isn't, uh, it isn't a great picture. Yes, and the Daily Mail, you know, as other papers do, points out that the bank is expected to hold interest rates at 5.25% mm. tomorrow when yeah. they make a decision, today for the papers, uh, but the markets believe the rate will start to fall this summer. People will be asking why. It's coming down, why? And the point is that the inflation target is 2%, and it, exactly. you know, it has been for yeah. so many years. Yeah, so it's still, you know, quite some way over it. But they expect to, I think, hit about 2% next month. Yeah, which would be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, you've got loads of global volatility, so yeah. Ukraine flares up again. If there's another hit to energy prices, that could, that could affect inflation again. But it's going the right direction. It's just whether it's quite intangible for voters to understand what inflation is. They just know that they feel worse off. So... Yeah. This is also the case. The government wouldn't take any responsibility for inflation going up. But, of course, a lot of it was Putin and, and yeah. Ukraine, yeah. Un undeniably so. And one of the, reason, well, one of the ways of bringing it down now, once all the, you know, didn't, want, didn't want to blame for it going up, wants credit for it coming down, is because, of course, interest rates have gone up. They've taken money out of the economy. We went into recession. And so uh, uh, retailers have had to cut their prices. Mm. So well, you, you, get, you get skinned, yeah, they got skinned by inflation, or now you get skinned by interest rates. Yes, and the eye talks about, again, interest rate cuts uh, after inflation fall come the summer, um, you know, put it on the, uh, on the wet and hope uh, bit. But food inflation mm. has been fascinating, not least because yeah. of Ukraine that you mentioned, you know, grain markets around the world, yeah. but also the weather in Europe. You know, yeah. that impacts fruit and veg rates mm -hmm. as well, doesn't it? And there's no suggestion that won't happen again for us. So yeah. food Brexit. inflation pressure by Brexit, yeah, that's it right. has, but it has but, uh, fallen sharply. I think it was at nineteen point five percent at some yeah. point, oh, and yeah. now it's oh, down yeah. to about five percent. And a lot yeah. of that, the reason food was costing so much was because of transport, because mm. the costs of transport were so high, and um, refrigeration, and everything else. And if that price starts coming down, that's obviously hugely affected the overall price, and um, but, things yeah. will seem better. But, but then again, when you go into shops, prices aren't falling they're by and falling. large. No. They're just they're going to stay where they were, or just go up a little bit Less slower than they were. <laughs> yeah. So you so you're not better off. Yeah. Yeah. The FT also leading on this, um, as you perhaps might expect, inflation's falling to 3.4%, keeps summer rate cuts on track. Everybody's got a similar message, do they not? Um, yeah. The rise in consumer prices for the year to February was below the 3.5% predicted by economists, uh, and January's 4% rate as well. So, it's, yeah. you know, it is moving in the right direction. They, have a, they also have a Rachel Reeves' la Labour's attack and their, their focus, which is uh, price is still high, tax burden high, it's been in 70 years, and mortgage payments are going up, which they are if you're coming off a fixed and you're going on, you know, the new rate, which can... <laughs> <laughs> a big hole in your pocket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone who's remortgaging at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, has this come at the right time, do you think, for Rishi Sunak, appearing before the 1922 committee, after the pressure, who knows from how many Tory MPs, about his leadership, do you think? Is this, you know, is this allowed him to reset in front of that backbench committee meeting in a more positive light? Well, most of his five pledges that he offered up to the voters for, for them to judge him on were economic and... Um, Falling infl halving inflation was one of them, and obviously he's more than done that. So he can really like point to this as a really good thing that that he's done. The trouble is, as I've said before, it's quite intangible for voters. It's how they feel. It's how wealthy they feel, not how not what the inflation's doing, or not what ever, what everything else is doing. Um, yeah. He had there was a really positive reception for him at the 1922 committee tonight, and um, I was outside listening to the banging on the desks and you know plenty <laughs> of Tory MPs coming out. I never and... went to a school like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but the louder the bang, you know, the worse it is for it because it's well... orchestrated by the whips and the few people who. Who, who like it. And well, they'd all had their Weetabix, there was a lot of banging on the yeah. tables, everyone's very positive, but I think one of the big yeah. reasons for that is they're now just about to break up for a three-week recess. Well, absolutely. And um, not going to be forced to do any votes anytime soon because they've delayed Rwanda until after Easter. Yes, this so, is the leave of the times, the times, isn't it? Once again, the House of Lords has uh, thrown out uh, the Rwanda bill, but instead of it ping-ponging straight back into the House of Commons, the government has decided to prioritise the May local elections, early May, um, and has told, you know, effectively um, Tory MPs to, to to go forth and and persuade people, presumably. <laughs> yes. Apply voters. <laughs> no, I didn't quite know where one, I was going with that. From, <laughs> yeah, from one to two, or whatever, because they're, they're, they're going to get a hammering, aren't they? We all, yeah, you know, they know they're going to get a get a hammering. But it, it's it's very given this is it was one of his five pledges. Yeah, I mean, the, so, yeah, inflation was only one of the five. He, you can say he hit, uh, but this is a flagship policy, and it's interesting because I think it's the scale. 
of those votes against in the House of Lords. The majorities are between 30 and 55, despite the fact they were resurrecting dead Tory peers and you know, bringing, the, bringing them in to vote to try and overturn Labour, Lib Dems, the crossbenchers, and some of their own, because James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, talks about Labour and their allies. Well, Ken Clark, now Lord yeah. Clark, uh, was leading the charge on the Tory benches, you know, over areas such as ignoring national and international law or threatening to deport to Rwanda on one-way tickets, people who fought with you know, the British um, armed forces in places like Afghanistan. I think that's just too much for some, some Tories. So well, obviously it... the Tories argue there are safe and legal routes for anyone who has worked for the yeah. UK. So thank you for balancing that. Out. <laughs> 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 well, about yeah. giving, and you're giving the government but you don't mean it, do you? It's just, it's, you just say that's what they say, <laughs> which I think is quite right to give their explanation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the meantime, Daily Express has word that they say on what might be in the Tory manifesto. This idea that the pension triple lock will be in the Tory manifesto. The Express always knows its readers clearly. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is this is expensive. This promise, is it not? When some might yeah. say there are other priorities. Hugely, and but you know, you're if you're the Tories, you're trying to shore up your vote. The people who vote for you are pensioners, and these are the people that you know they are lifeblood, they're the ones you need to get out to vote for you. And actually, you know, there a lot of the briefing around what will happen in the next election. There is, there is a lot of concerns that there's just a lot of apathy out there, people don't feel the need to go out and vote. and. They, there's not much enthusiasm for Starmer. There's very little enthusiasm from the Tory party, for the Tory party, as we can see in the polls. And you have to give a, people a reason to vote for you. So even pensioners, who always vote Tory, well, they're, that's, they're that's the only great thing for them. That's they're, a generalisation, to be fair. Yeah, it's they're, huge, they're, but it's but true. They are, they are the only demographic at the moment who are, you know, th those people who are nearer the, you know, the coffin and the cradle are the only, the only people who are given the Tories a majority. Every, everybody else is uh, the Labour majorities. And, what I, I can't understand is how they got themselves into a mess over Jeremy, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, saying, saying to Piers, oh, it's, uh, it's under review, how, that it might not have been in the manifesto when Starmer has said it will be in the Labour manifesto. I just... It's almost everything they do, they just do a bit bodged. Yeah. They sometimes yeah. get there in the end, but... And when is it true that the Labour manifesto is ready and the Conservative manifesto <laughs> is a work in progress? Is that...? Is that uh... Le Labour are in a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good, good shape. Pretty good state. Doesn't mean that what would have been a May manifesto will be a manifesto yeah. in October or November. I'm going for November. Well, we'd November. love to. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. We'd love to see what's in the Labour manifesto because I'm not sure. <laughs> what policies have they got left I think, now? I think, I think you'll, fi I think you'll find it's not going to be particularly detailed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a thematic. Oh, 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 We're going to be great. Yeah. 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 Probably won't be. Anyway, lots more still to come in the next part of our programme. Uh, another day, another royal story. The latest on how the Princess of Wales's hospital records may have been improperly accessed by staff. That is the investigation and allegation, at least. Uh, back with Adam Moore after this. got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings 
on Sky News. So welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Kevin McGuire and Claire Ellicott. Welcome back to both yeah. of you. Um, Claire, um, the Kate story, not making mm. the front pages like it has recently, um, but certainly a number of newspapers, including the Metro, putting a number on those who are now being investigated in terms of this alleged attempt to access her medical records. Yeah, I mean, this is a shocking story. Kate Middleton the Princess of Wales, went in for surgery, abdominal surgery, that's all we know. Obviously, everyone's fascinated. They signed her off from work till, well, from her, you know, her duties until Easter. Um, but, you know, speculation's been rife about where she is. We've had the controversy over the doctored photograph. And now this, there's three workers who are said to have tried to access her medical records. Allegedly. And they're, allegedly. Yeah. And they're <laughs> under investigation. It's at this, the London Clinic, which is, I think, where she's always had her, or the royals always have their um, operations. And um, the thing about it is, obviously, we all are desperate to know, but this is quite serious. You just don't think this should be happening in hospitals. And, you know, she's obviously gone through something. Yeah, she said, she, I think there's been briefings from the palace mm -hmm. that she intends to speak more about what's happened and what she's been through, partly because there's been such huge speculation about where she is. Well, partly happens. when she meets members of the public, it might come yes, out that's like the that. Suggestion but the point being, when there's or... privacy, which some people call secrecy, you know, there's a value mm. on the information and that's what, we, that's what yeah. we've started to see. You know, <clears throat> those who are accused mm -hmm. of doing this may, may have just been nosy. Yeah. They may not gonna, you know, wanted to <laughs> gossip to their friends but not make, put it in the wider public domain. But anyway, there are just incredibly strict and correct rules mm. against mm. doing this, and it's a criminal offence. And it's, it's quite right, whether you're a cleaner or a bus driver or you're a future queen, your medical yeah. information should not be accessed by others who, who are not authorised to do that. But for this, for this clinic, and my, my colleague Russell Myers, the Mirrors, Royal Editor broke yeah. this story. It was in, on the front of this morning's paper and widely followed up. Yeah, it, it's kind of... We knew there was at least one under suspicion, but we thought yeah. it was more, which, you know, using, using the term staff. But it just... This London clinic is so expensive yeah. and exclusive. Yeah. It's a disaster for them, an absolute disaster, because they will have people who particularly value their privacy and mm. secrecy. And they will now worry, has this happened before? But it could be, it could be that the hospital has a, a warning system. If somebody tries to access it, it, it flags up, lights, bells ring, and yeah, so you, you know, again. you know, immediately, and they don't actually get the information. That we don't know mm. yet, whether the information was actually obtained or whether it was an attempt 
to get it. Yes, and certainly the hospital stressed all its protocols and the reasons for its protocols today in its statement, did it not? Um, let's move on to the Daily Telegraph. Uh, mental health culture has gone too far, says Stride. This is Mel Stride, whose effective job in government has been to try and get people back to work, hasn't it? And one of the main reasons they're not back to work is because of mental health issues and the inability to access care for whatever it might be. <clears throat> I rem um, so, yeah, Mel Stride, the... Um, the, who's the pen work and pensions um, secretary of state? He his main job, as you say, is to get people back to work. I think when I realised that the biggest de spending department in government wasn't in fact health, which I think a lot of people assume, it's actually the welfare. It's actually his department, the welfare state, and um, billions and billions and billions of pounds go through this, and it's a real priority for this for Rishi Sunak's government to try to get everyone back to work. Um, at the moment, the, there's quite low unemployment, but as the economy starts to get better, there are fears that that may grow. And um, Mel Stride has come up with a series of sort of interventions to try to get people back to work. This is the latest. He's given an interview to the Daily Telegraph yeah. um, saying that mental health culture has gone too far. He thinks people can just go to the doctors, they get signed off work, they get benefits for it, they don't have to go to work, and this system needs to stop. And he's saying that... I think 150,000 um, people are signed off work with mild conditions and he wants to help them look for a job. Yeah. The welfare bill's going to hit 100 Just 30 million. seconds left. Yeah. Yeah, but, but by far right. the biggest component of his department spending is the state pension. Yeah. Right. But it, I value resilience and people kind of getting on with it, as it were, and if you can work, go to work. So it is... I'm, I'm not going to dismiss exactly what, what he's saying, but I think instead of shouting at people... You know, pull yourself together, get better, whatever. I think you somehow need to understand why they are the way they are, what the pressures they're feeling, and sort of cajole, coach, counsel, whatever, whatever it requires, back to work. Mm. Some, people are, some people are resilient, some people are not. Yeah. And you've got to help those who are not. Yeah, and some would say in the NHS, for example... Well, yeah. <laughs> ..the resilience has been hard to suffer because they're so under the cosh, aren't they? But yeah. we've run out of time. So much more mm. we could say. Luckily, you're back at the 11. Thank you very much mm. indeed, uh, for now. Uh, here's the weather.